Remember going to those sketchy cheat code websites back in the early 2000s? You probably felt like an elite hacker learning how to duplicate Pokemon in gold and silver. While it was fun to learn cheats for your Nintendo games, cheating in WoW is definitely not cool. But do you know what is? Clever game mechanics. MDI players know a bunch of them, and even have spreadsheets of every mythic dungeon, including detailed notes on how to cheese different trash and boss mechanics. We're not joking, we've seen them with our own two eyes. Today, we're going to reveal some of these secrets to the world, explaining the tactics being used by players in Echo and Method for pushing the highest keys. This guide will cover a lot, and we guarantee you will feel just like a kid learning cheat codes for your favorite childhood games. So stay tuned as we teach you the tips and tricks being used by some of the best players in Dragonflight Season 2. Let's start with a neat trick that some classes can use at the start of every dungeon. Any cooldown longer than 3 minutes will be reset once the key holder starts the run. While this doesn't work with Bloodlust, it does affect major CDs like Incarnation and Metamorphosis, allowing one free use before the initial pull. For this trick to work, the key holder should put the key in the pedestal, then any player should press their relevant CD. And once they do, the key holder will start the dungeon and activate the 10 second timer. Of course, this means that some of the cooldown will be wasted, but it's free anyway, so why not? Some dungeons even allow you to save a few seconds at the start of the run. Normally in Neltharian's Lair, keystone holders will start the dungeon and the group waits for the timer to tick down before jumping in the hole. While there is nothing wrong with this, we can save a few seconds off our run. To do this, we will start a pull timer before the dungeon starts. Then when the timer hits 4 seconds, everyone will jump into the hole. When the timer reaches 0, the keystone owner will start the run, causing players to teleport to the water slide and save a few seconds without much effort. Before we move on, for those of you new to this channel, we've been working with players from Echo and Method to bring you epic guides for ranking up in Mythic Plus. If you like what you've seen so far, please consider subscribing and tell us in the comments below what topics you would like us to cover next. Moving on, we have some class specific tricks which are important for everyone in the group to know about and we promise you will learn something new. Kicking things off, we have some warrior tech, including unique spells to reflect. As we mentioned, there are actually spreadsheets detailing every single spell that can be reflected, but for now, let's cover some of the highlights. First up, we have the last boss in Vortex Pinnacle. Chain Lightning hits for an absurd amount of damage, but since it is a targeted spell, warriors can reflect it when they are the target. Pretty neat, but we can take this a step further. That's because warriors can even reflect chain lightning on other players. As long as the warrior presses reflect before the chain lightning cast finishes and then moves into the target player's circle, the spell will be bounced back to the boss. Now let's go to Brackenhide Hollow where we can absolutely decimate the first boss with a high value reflect. Gash Tooth is one of the three gnolls you will fight during this encounter. Periodically, Gash Tooth will cast decayed senses on the tank, which deals a fair amount of damage but also disorients the target and leaves a nasty physical damage increase deep buff. Fortunately, protection warriors can reflect this ability, which prevents the disorient effect, but then also applies the physical damage vulnerability onto the boss themselves for a free damage modifier. Venturing on into Halls of Infusion, warriors are in luck because every single boss has a reflectable mechanic. The first boss is Watcher Iridius, and during the second phase of this fight, a nullification device will spawn and cast a spell called Purifying Blast, which applies a pretty nasty stacking debuff. Fortunately, warriors can just reflect this spell onto the device for some extra damage. Next up, the Gulping Goliath. Throughout the fight, the boss will cast Gulp in an attempt to consume nearby players or creatures. Players don't want to get hit by this at all, but if there is nothing around to consume, then the boss will become hangry and we don't want that. Fortunately, warriors can stand inside of the radius of Gulp and before the cast finishes, they can reflect, which will even apply a minor dot effect to the boss themselves. The third boss in Halls of Infusion will periodically cast Frost Shock. This is an instant ability that targets the tank. We suggest you monitor the timer of Frost Shock and press SR when it is almost ready. You'll get some free damage and the healer won't have to dispel you. Win-win. Finally, the last boss in Halls has two different spells that can be reflected. The first is Squall Buffet, and the second is Focus Deluge, which takes priority because it deals more damage. So help your healer out and press reflect when you see this cast. Adjacent to Spell Reflection, we have Spell Steal for Mages. Once again, there are so many buffs to steal across every single dungeon on bosses and trash. For now, let's go over some important ones. Towards the end of Uldaman, you will find two infinite Dragonflight mobs with stealable buffs. The first thing being infinite agents. Be on the lookout for Hasten, which is basically a mini bloodlust that you can steal for big damage. When up against infinite time reavers, check for stolen time, which siphons haste from your group and applies a buff to the dragon. 
This can also be spell stolen, removing the penalty of this mechanic. Moving on to the Underrot, you will encounter Devout Blood Priest, which casts an ability that literally makes its target immune to death for 20 seconds. Fortunately, a quick spell steal or even a simple purge effect is all you need to deal with this effect. Next up, in the Vortex Pinnacle, there are two notable buffs worth stealing. The first is from the Turbulent Squalls, who will use Storm Shield, which absorbs damage and pulses out AoE to nearby enemies. The second notable buff comes from the Empyrean Assassins, who cast Vapor Form, which offers an incredible 90% damage reduction buff, which you can simply take for yourself. As a bonus tip for mages, Alter Time can be used to cheese some mechanics, most notably as a skip to the Gauntlet phase on the last boss in Halls of Infusion. By pressing Alter Time a few seconds before the boss submerges, mages will automatically teleport past the entire gauntlet. This requires some precise timing, but is a neat trick nonetheless. Moving along, let's go over some priest tips, including how to min-max dominate mind, mass dispel, and mind soothe. As we all know, trash is often the biggest annoyance of every dungeon. But with Dominate Mind, priests can cheese their way through the most annoying headaches. Take for instance the Temple Adepts in Vortex Pinnacle, which are part of the trash at the end of the dungeon. By MCing the Adepts, your group has now gained an additional healer, and now there is no excuse struggling to these packs since you now have some free off-healing potential. In Neltharian's Lair, you will encounter some rock-bound pelters and trappers who do some insane damage on their own and can be deadly with two in the same pull. But with Dominate Mind, these pulls become a complete joke. In the Underrot, Feral Blood Swarmers can be some of the most annoying adds to deal with due to their silence and fixate effects. Luckily, you can MC them, which is especially useful when aggressively AoEing down trash, especially on bolstering weeks. Speaking of which, even affixes become much easier with MC. On spiteful weeks, priests can just throw Dominate Mind onto the shades, and eventually they will despawn. Next up for priest mechanics, we have Mass Dispel, which has plenty of uses. In Oldemon, there are two debuffs worth Mass Dispelling. On the third boss, be on the lookout for Burning Heat, especially on higher keys, since the overlap with Unstable Embers can be brutal for healers. MDing your group will be a huge help here. On the final boss in Oldemon, priests should be on the lookout for Time Sync. Being fast with MD here is enormously helpful. Finally, in the Underrot, priests should be ready to remove putrid blood from the party. Even shadow priests should look to help out their healer by clearing these deadly magical debuffs whenever possible. And finally, we couldn't talk about priest mechanics without mentioning Mind Soothe. By now, most players know how strong this ability is for saving time, being able to skip inefficient packs that would otherwise slow you down. Take the last room in Uldaman. You could waste your time killing all of these big dragons, or you could simply Mind Soothe them and breeze past. Even jumping up to the ledge around the room to quickly get to the last boss. What players don't know is how powerful Mind Soothe can be in combination with Ring of Peace. Yes, Ring doesn't put enemy mobs in combat, meaning you can Mind Soothe and then knock away any pack or patrol in your way. Another thing people forget is that using Fade also reduces aggro range, so in case priests are worried that Mind Soothe isn't enough, be sure to combine it with Fade to zoom past inefficient trash. Speaking of being efficient, Warlocks have a few different time-saving techniques of their own, thanks to Demonic Gateway. Two of these skips exist in Freehold. The first is on the Eastern Bridge. Here, there is a rather annoying Enforcer with a knockback and a relatively low efficiency score. So instead of having to deal with a pointless mob that will chase your entire group across the bridge, Warlocks can simply make a gateway to the middle of the bridge and skip this annoyance entirely. The second gateway skip is right before the final boss. At the end of the western bridge, there will be a small pack of mobs. Warlocks can aim their gateway up the platform in order to skip directly to the last boss. Once you're up there, be sure to kill this final pack since it is tethered to the boss. You can technically bypass this with Shadow Meld, but more on that later. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be many known gateway skips this season, but if you play Warlock or know of any other helpful ones, let us know in the comments below. Next up, if you've looked at the leaderboard lately, you probably noticed something. Everyone seems to be playing Dwarf. We're not going to tell you to shell out $25 for a race change, but here's why that might be a good idea. Right now, 10 out of 13 classes can all be dwarves, with the exception of druids, demon hunters, and evokers. This season, there are so many nasty debuffs, specifically bleeds, poisons, and diseases, which is why stone form is arguably the strongest racial in the game for this form of content. Some mechanics become way more manageable if most people in the party are dwarf. Take for instance, Naraxis in Neltharian's Lair. Toxic Wretch will be applied to the group multiple times during this encounter and it hits like an absolute truck. Of course, class specific poison dispels help clear the debuff, but Stoneform can help fill out any voids when dispels are on cooldown. 
Brackenhide Hollow is packed with mechanics designed to be countered by Stoneform. The first boss, or, well, bosses, include Gash Tooth, who applies a bleed called Gash Frenzy, which will last for 45 seconds, and unless the target is healed to full, Stoneform can remove this instantly, making the fight much more manageable. Moving on to Gutshot, his two hyenas will apply a bleed called Crippling Bite, which leaves a nasty healing reduction effect, and Trash, leading up to the last boss, also include a disease called Withering. Both of these debuffs can simply be dwarfed. Even when there are no debuffs to remove, Stoneform simply offers 10% damage reduction, which of course isn't the best, but puts it on par with Spirit Link Totem. As we all know, higher keys is all about mitigating damage, so why wouldn't you want to be Dwarf? Well, maybe you play Demon Hunter or Druid and just simply cannot be a Dwarf, but not to worry since Shadow Meld is quite good. Maybe not as good as Stoneform, but good enough to cheese some mechanics. For one, Shadow Meld will drop target, which is quite useful against any single player spellcast. Because it drops combat, healers can also use Shadow Meld as a way to get in a few drinks, even during trash pulls. Of course, there are limited windows to do this, but when damage is more manageable, a Resto Druid could simply apply HOTS to their entire party, then Shadow Meld drink to stay ahead on mana for more dangerous pulls. The combat drop from Shadow Meld also means that it can be used to resurrect players during trash, which is most useful as a hybrid. Note that this doesn't work on bosses since combat is global during any boss encounter. Finally, Shadow Meld can even be used to save time on trash that is tethered to bosses. Both Scorpion Packs and Neltharian's Lair are tethered to Dargruel, which generally means you can't skip this trash. However, as long as you kill one of these packs and have Shadow Meld in your group, that means you can skip the other. The player with Shadow Meld simply needs to pull the mobs off to the side and then Shadow Meld before they connect. While the trash is running back, the tank can pull the boss, which prevents the tethering from happening. Next up, let's go over some positioning hacks for two bosses this season. Going back to Neltharian's Lair, Naraxxus, of course, has that lethal spike tongue mechanic, which requires tanks to path through the puddles on the ground in order to not be consumed. Spike tongue can be cheesed by tanks by positioning behind the eggs in the back of the room. This requires a lot of mobility and is only reliably done by Vengeance Demon Hunters or Protection Warriors. The last boss in Brackenhide also has some unique positioning options for ranged DPS. Throughout the fight, she will spawn the Traveling Poison Cloud, which the group normally has to dodge, but ranged DPS can actually outrange the entire mechanic by positioning near the mushrooms near the 9 o'clock position of the room. The main drawback of this positioning is that it can make it difficult to attack the totems if they happen to spawn all the way across the room, and due to the increased range, the travel time on spells can hinder the ability to kill totems quickly, so be ready to reposition accordingly if needed. In Uldaman, everyone except the tank can position on this tent when fighting Bromac. While this might make it easier to avoid adds and AoE mechanics, it isn't necessarily recommended since it might create issues for interrupting or killing totems. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this one. If you enjoy the video and would like to see more content in the future, don't forget to give it a like and drop a comment to let us know your thoughts. We appreciate your support and thank you for watching. See you soon.